Hello, this is Dr. Lisa Belial, and you are listening to or watching Radio Maine. Today I have with me in the studio Dr. Sunil Malhotra, who is practicing at Maine Medical Center. That's correct, Lisa. And also a big fan of art, which yes. is which is our intersection. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me, Lisa. It's a real pleasure to come down here and uh, have this conversation. Sunil, I'm really fascinated by the work that you do, which is quite different than the work that I do in medicine and primary care, but I think a lot of intersections. Um, you are doing um, congenital cardiac surgery on a pediatric population. So you're in essence, you're mending little hearts. That's correct. So actually, uh, my scope of practice is uh, babies, children, and grown-ups that are born with heart defects. Um, and those heart defects can range anything from a hole in the heart all the way to a, uh, basically not having a full functioning pumping chamber or a disease of a heart valve that never developed or a narrowing in a major blood vessel. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of variety, tremendous uh, difference in the sizes of the patients I operate on, all the way from little preemie babies all the way to um, uh, grown adults who may have had multiple surgeries as children or may have found out that they have a congenital heart defect um, later in life. How, how common is that? Yeah, so uh, believe it or not, uh, congenital heart defects are the most common birth defect. Um, they occur in almost one in a hundred births. Um, now, not all of those defects are uh, serious enough to require surgery, but at least 40 to 50% are. So I think you and I could just go down this, <laughs> this medicine rabbit hole right. for quite a ways, and, and we will, I promise, because I'm fascinated by it. Uh, but I wanted to kind of talk about how you and I first met, and that is through the Portland Art Gallery. And uh, one day I walked in and I met this person who was in the medical field who also had a great love of art. And I, I believe I do remember that you were standing near a Darthea cross, similar to the one that's behind us. And you yourself have purchased quite a bit of art, actually. I have. And uh, well, thank you for uh, helping my introduction. That was actually my introduction really to Portland, Maine. Um, when I first uh, started my uh, position at Maine Medical Center, I was uh, living in an apartment right in the old port and used to walk down uh, to the gallery. And um, I knew that we'd be purchasing a home at some point, and um, I started to really have a, a desire to have a, a main feel, a coastal feel to the house. And, um, and I think that a lot of the artists that you carry really reflect that both kind of a main rugged individualism, but also there's... Uh, uh, a mood that's generated and that that resonates with me with art. I really need to have the both the color and the mood um, that can sort of set a balance if that makes sense uh, to you know it's nice to look at these paintings. you know I have uh, a Jean Jack painting as well as well as Dorothea Cross and Helen Lewis um, and the color they use and the um, emotion that it kind of evokes that waxing too poetic, uh, it sets me on, on a balance for my day. I can I don't know how to quite describe it too eloquently, but um, it, it kind of writes the ship, if that makes sense. So do you view your home, and I know that you have three children, three boys who are probably very um, active and energetic given the age ranges, all the way from seventh grade to college at this point? Correct, yes. Yeah, so that's, I'm sure there's a lot of energy in your home. There I'm is. I'm sure you have a lot going on, as we've already said, in your work day. But do you view your, your home, your, your space, as your, as your way to kind of come back to center? Absolutely. I mean, the word sanctuary is overused, probably, but it, it really, it's really helpful to have that, have that peace um, and almost tranquility um, so that uh, the craziness and chaoticness of the outside world and my day to day uh, is balanced out. I'm, I'm going to assume that working with patients who are coming in with something that is actually wrong with their heart, which is very central to us and something that we absolutely cannot live without. 
I'm going to assume that you are carrying a high level of um, emotion from their standpoint. How do you um, balance that out in an encounter with the patients and the families? Well, um, that's a huge component of what I do. Um, you know, obviously, uh, the main purpose of what I am here to do is to go in and uh, fix or repair heart defects and uh, make the heart work as best as it can um, and overcome the difficulties that these patients have. But the flip side of that is that there's a patient and more, more than the patient, there's the families, especially when it's involved with children. So you're really, um, the families are really your audience and your patients, um, extension of your patients, and you're really treating all of them. When I see these patients in the office with the families, it may be that this is the first time they're hearing about heart surgery in detail. Um, so I carry a lot of weight and it's, um, it's obviously a, a huge blessing that they entrust the care of their child in such a uh, tenuous time uh, in my hands. So um, it, it is it is a burden, but it's also a responsibility that I uh, that I cherish. You come from a family that is medical in nature. I sure do, and um, my uh, my father is a physician. He's a retired thoracic surgeon. I grew up in upstate New York in the Hudson Valley. Um, my uh, both my grandfathers were were physicians. My um, my sister's a physician, and then on my wife's family, uh, her father, her brother, um, multiple um, other relatives are all in the medical field. Um, so I would say that while um, I didn't always know it was going to be that I was going to go down a medical pathway, it was that exposure that always kept it in the background, uh, that, that exposure to, uh, these different medical fields and professions were, um, were certainly something that, uh, was always playing in the background. And as you said, it, it's, um, it's a responsibility, but it is also, I mean, it's, it's an enormous honor really to be part of patients' lives, to be part of people's lives. And unlike some fields you might choose, I mean, it is, it is truly a profession. It is truly something that you you dedicate yourself to when you make that decision when you're 16, 17, to go to college, to go to medical school, to kind of go on through. Um, is that something that you ever had conversations with your father about or your grandfathers or your family members, or was it just kind of implicit that this is the way that your family was and this is the way that um, you were going to be? Right. I'm not sure we really had a lot of career counseling at home. Um, my, my parents were Indian immigrants, um, that, uh, they had a very different path in going and achieving their career goals. Um, so the traditional, what I found sort of American way of exploration and educational, uh, um, I guess journey, uh, appealed to me much more. My, my parents were of the mind, I should try to go to a you know, a, a medical school that admits you from, uh, from high school, like a six year or seven year combined medical school. I, uh, pushed back a little bit against that. I wanted to have a liberal arts education. I wanted to, um, I wasn't sure I wanted to go into medicine, but once I arrived at that journey, um, and it really is a journey because in doing the field that I chose, um, it was 11 years of training after medical school. So I would say it's probably the longest path for any physician or uh, medical specialty you would have to go. I mean, there were classmates of mine who are brain surgeons who were done four or five years before me. Um, but that being said, I relish the journey I had, um, and uh, it's provided me the opportunity to, you know, really follow my dream, and that this was to be a pediatric heart surgeon. As a result of all of the time that you spent doing this training, you were able to come back, come to Maine, and actually start an entirely new program. That's right, Lisa. Um, you know, pediatric heart surgery had been practiced in various forms in Maine, actually since I think as early as 1959 or 1960 might have been the first uh, open heart surgery uh, for to repair a child's heart defect. Um, but 
when uh, Maine Med had uh, reached out to me, uh, they were restarting a program that had um, that had been on pause as the previous surgeon had left. Um, but the nice thing about that is that there were there were so many people who were uh, had experience and had this institutional muscle memory, so that um, coming back and restarting the program and me instituting uh, my vision of what a program should be uh, wasn't uh, too much of a struggle and uh, was actually a lot of fun. It was almost like a startup. We uh, people were very enthusiastic. Um, and I should mention that this is a huge team endeavor. Um, there's uh, everyone from the uh, the physicians that care for the children, the uh, anesthesiologists, the ICU staff, the ICU nursing. Um, it's it's a tremendous undertaking, and it's, uh, it's really a testament to uh, real commitment from the uh, administration to really put the resources behind doing it the right way. Is there in Maine a higher incidence of congenital heart defects than other parts of the country? No, actually, um, it's interesting. I think in Maine, a lot of people talk about it's more it's a more aged population or the average age is a little older, so perhaps the birth rate may be lower. Um, there, we do find that there are regional differences Um you know, I find that there are certain heart defects that are more prevalent here than in other places I've I've practiced, um, but um, but I wouldn't. I'm not sure if there's a higher incidence, but it's definitely uh, a real need to have this service in the state, because otherwise you're asking people from all parts of the state to have to go to a regional center like Boston, which is an outstanding institution. It's just very challenging, a lot of hardship for our families to have to, I mean, some of them find Portland uh, challenging. So going to Boston, you can imagine that's a real hardship. Yeah, it's true. Where I practice up in the Augusta Waterville area, when, when you tell somebody they're going to Portland, it's, it's, it's as if you had said, we're going to fly you to the moon. Yes. And, um, and I think you're right. It's, there's, there's a distance aspect, but it's almost a completely different world to them. And so that much further down to Boston, which is a more urban setting with things like traffic and all of those things on top of this very emotional conversation they're going to be having, you know, related to their heart. I think that would really add up to some stress. Sure. It's, it's a very stressful time for the families um, and for us to be able to uh, provide this kind of service uh, here in Maine, I think takes away a lot of that stress and it helps, I think, towards the healing, and it helps the social situations that a lot of our families are in. You and I were talking before we came on the air about the use of telehealth to reach out to some of these families. Tell me what your experience has been with that. Yes. So it's uh, an interesting byproduct of our pandemic times, I think, that we've found that telehealth um, goes beyond just being able to see patients that are perhaps... Uh, uh, affected by COVID, um, it also enables us to s decrease the travel time for some of our patients. If I have to counsel a family about an upcoming surgery, I don't necessarily need to be sitting in the room with them. Um, and so if they have to drive three hours or five hours, uh, it, it alleviates that and they can be in their living room and we can have the discussion uh, about what, what to expect um, and uh, going forward, what what surgery will entail. We've had a lot of conversations about um, social determinants of health, and this is something that I know I see in, in my part of medicine, the primary care part of medicine, um, but I imagine it also has an impact on the work that you do. Absolutely. Um, a growing part of, of our patient population are adults with congenital heart disease, and many of them are um, children who have graduated into adulthood because our our outcomes have improved with uh, dramatically with uh, with children who need heart surgery, um, and that there are actually more um, patients now that are adults. They outnumber the children with heart heart defects, and so what happens typically is as these patients get into their twenties and thirties and they're feeling good, they they lose touch with their um, congenital heart or cardiology providers, and. The other drawback is is that 
um, until recently, there weren't a lot of opportunities. Uh, there weren't there wasn't a lot of access for patients who are adults to have adult congenital cardiologists. Um, and fortunately, we've developed an adult congenital program, a center for uh, adults with congenital heart disease, with uh, two providers that we've recently uh, recruited that are uh, fully boarded adult congenital cardiologists, which is a relatively new uh, board specialty, um, so that it allows us to bridge that gap for these patients that have had a fair amount of, uh, um, I guess, loss to follow up. Switching gears back to the art realm, um, having a, a sister and a brother who are both surgeons and also in-laws who are surgeons, I know that they tend to be very, they're very visual individuals. Um, and both of them, both of my sister and my brother are orthopedic surgeons, so they specifically are dealing with, you know, bones, joints, muscles. Um, I'm guessing that if you're dealing with um, what tend to be on the small side of hearts, you also must have a fairly strong visual sense and a pretty strong um, attachment to kind of the visual way of learning and the visual style of interacting with the world. You're absolutely right. The, um, the kind of work that I do involves a lot of geometry, a lot of three-dimensional thinking. Um, when I'm recreating a wall in, a, uh, in the heart uh, or a, a blood vessel or making a heart valve work, you have to think in very much a three-dimensional way, and you're designing these patches and these reconstructions that really have to work in an organic manner. Um, so it is very much three-dimensional thinking. It's three-dimensional views of, of how things work, um, and there's a lot of geometry involved. It's, it's, all, it's all visual. It's, it's, it's all, um, you know, sometimes even visualization before you go into the operating room. Sometimes we print out models using 3D printing to look at how am I going to approach this surgically planning, planning that. Um, so it's an extremely visual field, and it's one of the things that really drew me to the field um, because um, each surgery is a little different, and the variety of the surgeries uh, really keep me engaged. Um, and it's, uh, it's the challenge of being able to do that reconstruction of the heart um, and make it work in a three-dimensional fashion, that, that is the exciting challenge for me. So when you talk about geometry, I can't help but think about the piece behind us and Dorothy across and, and this idea of essentially um, geometric shapes. I mean, obviously kind of geometric, but in a uh, kind of with a twist to them, I guess, which actually is a little bit like a heart because hearts obviously don't have perfect you know, parallelograms within them. Do you think that this is one of the reasons why when you look at a work by Dorothy Cross, you think, oh, that's something that really appeals to me? Most likely. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not good at psychoanalyzing myself, but uh, I think if you probed a little bit, you would see that I probably do connect with uh, the almost, um, I would say, abnormal geometry of some of these you know the, it's organic geometry because they're you're right they're not perfect squares or 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 shapes but they're shapes that as a representation of what we see in nature um and i think you know these shapes are formed by contact with the water or the sea um, and these types of shapes are organic and that's the, the interpretation by the artist is is what i find very compelling when you were younger, how did this visual sense um, manifest itself? How, when you were growing up, did you have an interest in art? Did you have an interest in photography? Was, was there some way that you were kind of developing as a child that you already knew that this is a direction you were heading in? Not at all. I, honestly, um, I was a horrible artist. I, I never colored in the lines. I the most awful penmanship. Maybe that was the prerequisite for going to medicine, uh, not breaking any stereotypes. But um, I think, but I do think what was uh, during when my upbringing, I was always drawn to complexity. Um, so for example, uh, when I had to choose an instrument in fifth grade to play, I chose the French horn because I was told it was the hardest to play 
it was uh, designed with all this tubing, and it really required you to, you know, use a special use of your diaphragm to get the different pitches. Uh, needless to say, I wasn't very good at it, but that was the reason I chose it, because I thought it was the most complex instrument to try to play. Um, and uh, I, I would say that I always, uh, I, I never really took the easy classes, um, for better or for worse. When I was in college, um, you know, I could have majored in anything, but I really loved chemistry and biochemistry. I took physical chemistry, and I didn't even take the chemistry for, um, you know, uh, for pre-meds. I took it for the chem majors because I, I, wanted, I wanted that challenge. And the grades weren't always the best, but uh, it was that, I think it was always that complexity um, that, to keep me interested, to keep me engaged. And I think that's what ultimately drew me to um, congenital heart surgery because there are, you know, 20 to 25 different heart defects. There's probably 40 different kinds of operations we can do. Um, the level of complexity and the nuance from patient to patient varies. Uh, the problem solving behind how to tackle each one is is different. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question, but I, I think that's that more than the artistic part is the complex nature of systems is what has always sort of driven me. Well, there's, I'm, I now feel much more um, uh, kind of a, attached to you because as a fellow player of French horn and, <laughs> and I would admit extremely bad player of French horn, I had the same kind of experience, which was here's this instrument. Nobody else is playing it. We need one. It's kind of hard to play. See what you could do with it. And I was like, all right, well, that's fine. Let's jump on in. Um, but I don't think that that is a normal response. I think that there is more of a tendency towards safety, towards simplicity, um, and I and I and in this last few years of the pandemic, we've seen that systems complexity is a very real thing. And I think for some people, it's been a uh, a time of real fear and anxiety and withdrawal. And for other people, it's kind of a moving towards. Where would you fall on that spectrum? Yeah. So the last couple of years has been challenging for um, society in general. People have had struggles dealing with from a health standpoint, from a mental health standpoint. Um, I, I feel fortunate that I have support systems in place, whether it be family, extended family, um, my career, that have kept me um, in the structure that, that helps me keep going. But, I, but you know, there, there are, um, obviously, remote work has given people a lot of freedom in ways um and that a lot of that may be long lasting beyond the pandemic um but i was happy to have the structures in place that i had that i think helped me get through what what was a challenging time so given that you had these structures in place but that you probably were um there was probably the same issues that all of us in healthcare had. Like patients couldn't come into the office. You know, we, I know that you probably had surgeries that had to be canceled and rescheduled. Um, did you feel like because you had this background in kind of tackling difficult things, it, it seemed somehow less intimidating to you? Yes, I think we had unknowns around every corner. Every week it would be a new challenge. Uh, and some challenges were were unsurmountable because of the fixed nature of them, such as because of the pandemic, fewer people were going to donate blood. So we didn't have enough banked blood in our stores to do the surgeries. Or uh, we'd have to get creative and figure out how to stratify the surgery so that we could do one kind of surgery that would be uh, less taxing on the system first and then try to get the other surgery in the following week. So you had to be able to make decisions on the fly. You had to be able to, uh, you know, there were curveballs thrown at us that we didn't even anticipate because of, of the pandemic that affected systems, that affected supply chain issues. Um, so you really had to be prepared. Um, and it was really incumbent upon us to have uh, open communication with all different aspects of the medical center uh, to really plan uh, the best way to be able to treat our patients. And we 
basically had to pivot from week to week to week. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'd say because of the teamwork we had, we were able to get through it. You have a very impressive um, resume, you know, yes. Cornell and Stanford, University of California at San Francisco. I mean, the list, the list goes on. So it's interesting that you would say, I approached these classes. Maybe I didn't get the best grades, but I think it's pretty important for people to understand that you still did very well for yourself. Do you think as part of this education, what you were learning was not just content, but also how to think, how to approach um, learning and the way that you were going to look at your professional development? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the I always say that the journey that I went on was tremendous for me, my personal growth. Um, there are there are times along the way where I, I did things that were a little bit unconventional, such as during my general surgery residency, I took two years out to do research at the University of California, San Francisco, um, where I was able to do this cutting edge work on fetal heart surgery, on um, looking at the effects of what we were doing on the, the pulmonary uh, vasculature, um, and to be able to think take yourself out of clinical medicine and go into uh, the scientific method and learn how to construct experiments, how to make uh, scientific models and to do s uh, national presentations. That's a whole different um, skill set that I didn't have. And so all those things add up in terms of how you analyze literature, how you improve your practices. So I, I think um, certainly... Um, my career development was uh, stronger for it. You also have done research that I find very interesting um, because I'm, I deal with a lot of the after effects of, say, surgical interventions. Sure. Um, and this is research in the neurodevelopment, the longitudinal neurodevelopment of patients after heart surgery, which is to say, once you have operated on them, how, how do their brains and their um, thought processes um, kind of exist within the world? So why did you get interested in that in the first place? Um, the reason was because, you know, pediatric heart surgery is, in the scheme of medical treatments, relatively young. I'd say we, we've only been practicing modern pediatric cardiac surgery um, probably for the last 30 years. And over the last probably 15 years, uh, we've really refined our outcomes. So we actually do a very good job of getting patients through the surgery um, and having uh, survivors, even a, a very critical heart defects that would have been lethal um, 40 years ago. So while we're, we have these survivors that are doing better and better, we, they're not always thriving after they have their repairs. They have... Uh, insults to brain development um, and cognitive skills, learning in school, higher level uh, executive functioning. Um, and so a whole branch of developmental, neurodevelopmental cardiology came out um, to follow these kids and really watch what how these kids develop. And so some of the research I'd, I've done is to look at, is there anything we're doing during surgery th that can tell us um, uh, is there an impact on, on brain injury? And so um, I had looked at some biomarkers um, that look at um, brain injury, either white matter or gray matter brain injury, um, and it helped, helped us streamline and inform our discussions with families about what kind of operations um, can um, impact the children and what they can expect uh, growing up. And the children after heart surgery still need to be followed in a neurodevelopmental um, fashion so that we know where their deficits may lie um, and we can attend to them. So that's that's interesting because I think, you know, during that same time frame, we were recognizing that adults who had had, you know, heart 
you know, issues who had had a cardiac arrest, for example, they'd come out on the other side, they'd have memory loss, they'd have depression, um, it would really impact them socially and emotionally. And, and, I, and I do believe that it's really within the last, say, 25 years that this is something that we've put more of an effort into addressing. Um, but prior to that, it's not necessarily something we would think of. You know, this is in this part of you, and this is in this part of you. So thinking about the patient as a whole person and whatever impact you're making kind of on this part when they're younger um, and how that moves forward longitudinally, that, that puts an added responsibility on you. It absolutely does, uh, but it's a responsibility that we have to bear because uh, we are uh, committed to treatment of the whole patient. And when you're operating on a baby or a child, the rewarding part of it is that you've given them now another 70 years, 80 years uh, of, of life, but you also want to make sure that they have quality of life. And I think that's what a lot of our work has been towards, um, minimizing trauma, minimizing the socio-psychological impact of surgery and, um, and minimizing the, uh, the effects that we have on the other organ systems, such as the brain. You recently went to Kenya. So you're doing work not only in our wonderful state here in Maine, but also in other parts of the world. Why Kenya, and why is that important to you? Uh, thanks for bringing that up, uh, Lisa. That was a very rewarding trip that uh, our team took back in uh, November. It was a team uh, predominantly from Maine Medical Center that has had a longstanding relationship with uh, Tenwick Hospital in, in Kenya. Uh, this is a... Uh, relatively high-functioning um, hospital that uh, really needs the expertise of both the uh, surgical expertise and the ICU, intensive care, intensive care nursing, um, to be able to uh, handle the burden of doing pediatric heart surgery on uh, this population in Kenya, where it's heartbreaking because there are so many patients waiting for surgery um, that we actually have to, um, you know, really prioritize. You know, we're there for a week. We parachute in and then leave, which is. But but the important thing is is that we are teaching their local surgeons how to manage these, so that if a very sick child comes in, they need to manage it. They can do the surgery. But um, it was very busy. We did. We operate on twelve children in five days, um, with very good results. And uh, like I said. Um, you know, we we participate in teaching for the the surgical trainees there. We I gave them lectures. The the nurses uh, that were part of our team taught the nurses that were there. Um, so we're really trying to strengthen their infrastructure um, so that they don't have to be so reliant on these teams. Unfortunately, many of the teams had to cancel their um, trips uh, because of uh, uh, COVID and uh, not being able to bring uh, travel uh, to Africa, but we were fortunate to be able to have that impact. Um, and it's a, it's a huge impact. It's, it's, uh, it's very rewarding. Do you ever think about um, health equity? I mean, it, it sounds like if by going to Kenya, you're, you're acknowledging and you're participating in creating improved health equity kind of globally. And by being here in Maine and trying to do things for patients really around the state, you're, you're, thinking about health equity. Is this something that you put any kind of conscious thought into, or is it something that you are, you just kind of live and, and do on a daily basis? I'll be honest, it, it wasn't something that um, was really top of mind as I was going through my training journey. But I think as, as a physician who's part of, you know, a greater society, um, that's something that I think I become more aware of, that, um, we have to be uh, cognizant not only of being able to provide access to all groups of patients, but also uh, to be um, uh, mindful of uh, cultural differences, um, whether it be in um, different cultures. You know, we have a number of immigrant communities in in and around Portland and Maine uh, that that see things differently, and that. Um, Sometimes there's shame associated with uh, with sickness and illness, and um, we 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 try to acknowledge that and, and encourage the community that they come from to support them. Um, so so there is a lot of um, 
emphasis, I think, and awareness now of of equity, whether it be um, you know patients of different sexual orientation, the LGBTQ community, um, whether it be uh, along racial or socioeconomic lines, um, and I, I think those are all positive movements in our field to to be fully aware of of, of those considerations. Do you think that your own family background um, helped you to think about equity and inclusion um, as you moved forward in your own career? Well, Lisa, I think my experiences as um, non-Caucasian growing up, in, like I said, I grew up in the Hudson Valley. Uh, it was a very predominantly white. Um, you know, people didn't necessarily, uh, weren't aware of uh the uh, immigrant experience, uh, at least non-European immigrant experience. Um, so there were certainly instances that along my my travels, uh, my journey, that uh, were challenging, uh, challenging interactions, uh, et cetera, uh, mostly stemming from ignorance. Um, and um, so I think that those, those experiences informed me in my development going forward. Well, I'm I'm interested in this and in your experience in particular because Maine, you know, you you are practicing in a part of the state that does have some pockets of um, certainly um, kind of cultural diversity. I would say that the you know a large part of Maine is not particularly diverse, except maybe socioeconomically diverse. And so in working with some of the physicians I've worked with up in my part of Maine, I know sometimes there, there's there been some question about, you know, whether they are accepted within the community that is not that diverse. And, and I know that sometimes it can be painful, really, because you are working toward the greater good and you're really dedicating your life to something that's important. So to feel as if maybe you're not accepted for the person that you are, I, I've seen a certain amount of... Um, challenge and accepting that is that something you've ever experienced it's i think pretty rare in, in what i do because i think regardless of your background um when you're meeting a, a physician who's going to be operating on your child and your child has uh you know maybe you just received this devastating diagnosis or this challenging uh, situation um i think there's there's common threads across cultures that, you know, we want to be very protective of our children. And so what I find is that there's, um, the, the families are just looking for comfort, looking for security, looking that their child will be, will be taken care of and will, uh, will have quality care. Um, and so I, I think that's probably top of mind to them um, for the patients that I, that I see. Uh, and sort of there's always nuances with, with different experiences, with uh, different communities, uh, which we have to take into con consideration. But I think um, the gravity of the situation that these families find themselves in is, is uh, kind of trumps everything else, if that makes sense. So it sounds like the, the context and the perspective for you is perhaps different than maybe a family doctor who's trying to practice in, you know, the middle of Maine. But but also the shared humanity that you're describing is really the most important thing and coming to a place of commonality and trying to understand each other as human beings is is probably the most important. I agree with that. Some pretty heavy topics we're talking about. Yeah. For a show that typically deals with <laughs> art. So I appreciate your willingness to to walk this path with me. Um your three boys. And your and your wife. How do they like Maine? Uh, they they've enjoyed Maine. Uh, um, my wife is uh, getting used to the the winters. Um, she has um, she has her own studio that she works in. We have a barn on our property, um, and so she is a a brand consultant and a brand photographer. Um, so I think that's nice for her to be able to step out of the house and go to her her workspace. Um, and the nice thing is that we designed it to have a lot of light. So even if it's cold outside, um, the, uh, the bright light at least can lift your mood when you're, when you're working away. Uh, and my kids have really enjoyed it. My, uh, uh, one of my sons is, uh, really, uh, a sports aficionado. 
he's got a job with the Maine Celtics, so uh, he's uh, he's enjoying uh, the sports scene here. Um, uh, my oldest son came here when he was finishing high school, so he's off in college, and uh, my youngest son is uh, also enjoying uh, enjoying Maine. So. Well, we are very happy to have you here, and I'm really pleased that you were willing to take the time out of your day to come and have a conversation with me. I've certainly learned a lot about you, and um, it's nice to have a fellow art lover and physician and French horn player to have a conversation with. Who knew, Lisa? Well, my pleasure. Was, uh, thanks so much for the opportunity. I've been speaking with Dr. Sunil Malhoitra, and this is Dr. Lisa Belial for Radio Maine. Please learn more about Jean Jack and Darthea Cross and Helen Lewis at the Portland Art Gallery. And hopefully you'll come down someday and you'll get to meet Dr. Sunil Malhoitra along with me at one of our openings. Thank you for coming in today. Thank you.